hello, and welcome back to another episode of Minority Reports podcast and digital series. I am your host, Mona Sheikh. Sometimes my live stream says that it's on, it's still going, and then later I look at it, and it's like, no, you were live for like 30 seconds, and it always does that. So I don't know, not always, but sometimes it does that. So anyways, I am very excited because A, it's Friday, B, I am vaccinated, uh, and C, um, I'm, I'm, I'm vaccinated. I'm very happy. So there's a lot more freedom that I have. And I'm very excited about my guest because I messed up the date because I thought I had him last week. But the truth is that I have him this Friday and I am happy that it's this Friday and not last Friday. Uh, but anyways, my guest today is an amazing producer and director, and he has directed The Walking Dead. Uh, he's been a director on the 911, and I'm going to have him, uh, you know, we're going to talk about his career and his journey to uh, being a producer and director. Here's a very talented, Shadows Raju, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm glad to make the list of uh, the vac- from Vaccination Friday and then talking to me. Vaccination Friday. Did you get vaccinated yet? No, not yet. I tried. Uh, I tried to wait in line somewhere to be on standby, and I waited about four hours. And I didn't get it. So, but in a couple of weeks, I think. Yeah. Oh man, I heard that. Uh, when is it opening in California? Is it May first? I heard April first for fifteen over, and then April fifteenth for sixteen and over. So basically, everyone after that. It, okay, and then May. Over. Yeah, and then I think yeah. So I think it's basically April, mid-April. Okay, mid-April. All right. Are you are you more uh, a two-shot kind of guy, or are you a one-shot kind of guy? You know, get whatever. Give me whatever is available. <laughs> just jab me already. Just, just freaking jab me. Just let's, yeah. let's just end it. Let's just end it. Whatever it is. Well, thank you for being here, and I I wanted to kind of uh, take a moment and ask you about how, as a producer and a director, have you been working during the pandemic, or has it been crickets? Yeah, so um, about a year, so a year ago when everything shut down, I, I was directing a show that ended right before, like around February, and then oh, March, wow. um, and then in March everything shut down, like the whole the whole film industry shut down. So I was, um, yeah. I I was supposed to go to do a show in April, and then they they postponed because no one at that time knew like maybe things would come back and. So no one's really certain, and then and then the whole industry at large just said we have to figure out how to re- how to work safely. So then, all last summer, the studios and the unions all got together to 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 they, they created a white paper. They did a lot of research and a lot of talk with public health officials to figure out you know how one can operate a show or a film set safely because yeah. you're in very close proximity. This, with a lot of people. I mean, if, if you're working on a major television show, it's 150 people on a set. Right. And you're, as a director, you are you have to get very close to people. And the actors are the most vulnerable because they don't have masks and they're going to be That's interacting right. and they have to actually, you know, be very close to each other, very intimate. So it's, yeah. uh, they have to develop s- some kind of system and how to work. So that took basically all of summer. And then around August, maybe September, then things started to reopen. Like they started to, they had a plan in place. They started to implement it. So shows started up again, movies started shooting again. Um, and it's been hit or miss. I mean, it, it, I started up again and in December, I started working on a show in December and up and through, through now I've been working on a show. So it's so, that's what I've been doing. I mean, for the most part, I, I was running a preschool and daycare, uh, part, you know, nonprofit in my home for, about 10 months. <laughs> that was my primary, that was my primary mode of employment. Um, we had a lot of staff revolt, but uh, that was a, that, <laughs> wait a minute. Basically... This, this nonprofit uh, uh, child support, the, the, this uh, daycare at home, is this, are you referring to your own kids? Are you referring yeah. to other people's kids? No, that's my kids. <laughs> it was unplanned. Uh, but uh, that was what, you know, what, what a lot of us had to do. So um, yeah. So now, now things are, you know, I mean, there's still a pandemic. There, there's still, you know, possible transmission and infections. But there's a whole series of protocols. Like I get, I have to go test three times a week, and and they oh, have no. different tiers. Like if you're in a certain zone, then you, if you're like in zone A, that means you're the ones who can be close to the actors. So the actor, everything was sort of revolves around protecting the actors because they're the only ones who can't right. have masks when they're working. That's correct. so. If you're within contact of them, you're part of this this tier that has to be, you know. Th- 
assured that you have no you have no infection even then like shows have shows have routinely had to shut down i mean even the shows i've worked on had to shut down you know someone gets sick on some part of, i mean there's some of the some of the crews also segmented so like you could if some part of like the art department gets sick on a show that only works in the office you can quarantine them and then keep working but some shows have had to shut down completely i've had a lot of friends who've they had to shut down. They had to quarantine themselves for two weeks and then restart. And so it's been, it's been very, it's been a very strange thing. And also, then when when I'm working now, I have had to wear a mask and shield while I'm That's directing, right. which is a weird, which is sort of a weird thing to do when you have to yeah. talk to an actor um, or yeah. to talk to a crew, right? So, but anyway, yeah, it's. Yeah. I, I mean, it's good that they figured out a way to do it, but it's it's very strange. Wow. I mean, in a way. Um, you can also kind of, once everybody gets vaccinated, you can also kind of start like a hu- side hustle of a daycare because now you're really good at it. I I would debate whether I'm good at it. <laughs> you have, have to have to ask the family. I don't know if I'm good at it. <laughs> I, 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 if the kids are breathing and they're eating and they're, uh, they're happy, I think, it, I think you've done a good job. Happy. Eh, we'll see. <laughs> I mean, who, I mean, really, Breathing. who the hell, Breathing. who the hell is happy right now, Sharad? Please do tell. Yeah, Besides Elon true. Musk and freaking Jeff Bezos, who's happy? Please do tell. That's right. That's true. That's true. You're right. <laughs> I mean, four hundred percent. You know, increase. I mean, in wealth, like that's amazing. You know. Yeah. But that's not the same for uh, artists. Uh, I, I mean, we've been. I, I honestly, Sharad, I'm a stand-up comic and I tour around the world and. I lost like almost like 90, 95% of my income. It's just disappeared. Sure. Oh yeah. It just, yeah. it just left. I mean, um, I heard that in uh, New York city, like two thirds of artists have like pretty much left town. They, they've lost all their jobs. So, and you're just like, wow, how is Broadway going to survive? Like how, you know, what is going to happen? I mean, this pandemic, have you had like any like spiritual epiphanies during the pandemic where you're just like, man, <laughs> Well, I mean, gosh, I must have had many. I, I'm uh, trying to, it does make you re- make you realize how fragile the whole system is, you know. Because mm-hmm. if if suddenly then you can't do the things that either you know provide you with source of me resources and means, and then you can't also do the thing you love, like what do you do? I mean, a mm-hmm. lot of people were pretty. There are some people who were very resourceful who were able to like do things like this, like create a podcast or create something that they they can they can do from home or um they do you know some people made like co like like films with in their house with the people they live with you know the, so whatever so some people are very resourceful i mean a lot of people was, was, were writing like i was trying to do as much writing as i could like i tried to take an opportunity to do that but you know even yeah. then like if you have a family if you suddenly don't have people to come who can come over here take like at a, we couldn't have our caretakers come over for a long time and we usually have sure you know, grandparents, my parents or my wife's parents stay live with us usually. And they all went away. So, you know, we all had to adjust. So I think like, I think the biggest thing is sort of realize like, oh, how everything is sort of connected. And you, if you pull out the rug, then you see like, oh, we're all, everything is dependent on a series of very delicately balanced (laughs) things that if you pull one out, then like, you know, everything kind of crumbles. So, I, it's right. like, I guess the yeah, so it's a lot of the epiphany just sort of appreciating just how you know delicately balanced everything is. Right, right. I I feel like also how fragile life is. Right, we make all these plans, we put in all this work. We're just like, oh, I'm gonna achieve this and I'm gonna do that, and then you know, one one virus can come along and be like, let me stop you right there. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. not gonna work. Uh, and you're like, oh shit, I could just. You could just die. I mean, uh, I have at least four people I know personally that have died due to COVID. I mean, it's it's pretty bad, right? Or yeah. people that I, you know, whose parents have died. I mean, it's it's pretty bad. But I wanted to actually uh, get to know about your journey to being a producer and a director. Were you did you start off as an actor and then transition into being a producer director, or you oh, that was not the case? <laughs> I am not. I am not. I am behind well, I, the camera. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm certainly a, I had no desire or talent to be an actor. No, I uh, I'm you know like I have immigrant parents. You like a lot of us. My parents came from from India. My parents are Bangalore from Bangalore and Mysore, South Indian. And um, 
Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Chicago. I, I didn't grow up around the film industry. So, I mean, I had some sense that films were made by people. I didn't know, like, one can go into the film industry. Just sort of like you go to the farmer and you you, you go to the, the grocery store and, eat and pick an apple. You don't really n- think about the farmer and the person who picked the apple. You just sort yeah. of think, go, like, you go to the movie theater to watch a movie. You don't really think about all the people or that one can go make movies. But I was I can't I came from a family that had a literary tradition. My grandfather was a famous poet in in, in, in the kind of the language, and my wow. my uh, Gopal Krishnadiga and my dad and mom were both always. My dad writes fiction and nonfiction, um, and we had grew up around. We just grew up in sort of a literary family tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I sort of when I went to college, and I I kind of always knew that I wanted to be a writer. I wrote. At the school news, at the student newspaper, um, I was a writing major, and I started making film projects, and I just fell in love with it. And I, because r- directing is sort of to me writing in three dimensions, and you get to where you get to move in space and actors and music, and the whole thing is is like creating a book, but like uh, it's a life. And yeah, so I just fell in love with it, and I just didn't want to do anything else. So then I figured, you know, I wanted to learn. More. I made some very bad project in college. And I was like, I want, and, and I'd wanted to get better. So I, I knew I would, you know, wanted to go to graduate film school. So I moved out to LA and I started, um, I was an assistant. I was my, I got a job in the industry while I was applying to film schools. And I was a casting assistant to one of the top casting directors in the world, Mal- Mally Finn. And so I worked on the matrix sequels and eight mile and, um, oh, wow. a, a bunch of other movies and TV shows. So I got to see, I mean, I was an assistant, so I, you know, I had a very small role in all of those, but I got to see a, a lot of actors come in and perform. So mm-hmm. I got to learn a lot about performance. And and then, I, yeah, then I got into the American Film Institute's directing program. And um, at AFI, I, my film coming out of AFI was American Made, which had Cal Penn and Bernie White and, and Sakina Jaffrey. And that was my first film that went out into the world. And that won a couple dozen awards and it was ended up being broadcast on television it sort of started my career um yeah but even you know even then like your career as a filmmaker is sort of like in ups and downs you know i spent probably about 10 years as a independent filmmaker sort of scrapping together a living you know writing scripts for people sometimes making some projects sometimes getting a little yeah. bit you know a little funding for a project here a little fun funding for a project here and all this while, I was still, you know, trying to make my own projects, bigger projects, and and uh, and breaking the television. And then finally, you know, I was a, I got into some directing programs at the networks, ABC and NBC, and Sony Pictures, and they have you sort of shadow on television shows. So in NBC, I shadowed on Law and Order SVU, um, yeah. which shoots in New York. And so after after I shadowed there, they they gave me an episode. That went well. They gave me a second episode, and then I sort of just started directing television. So for the last seven years, I've six years, I've directed uh, about almost uh, thirty-five episodes of television. So wow. yeah, that's and in TV, um, most people, not a lot of people know. I guess not everyone knows this, but TV there's a different director per episode. So um, you know, that's right. You sort of. So you go from what, so they, a season of television, you know, they may have ten different directors. So sort of go from show to show. Um, so yeah, why, so do I, they for, do that? why do they do that, Sharath? Why different directors for every episode? Why? Sure. So, so uh, the reason is in a production calendar, the thing that's expensive is, is shoot days, like per, actually physically production days. That's the most expensive thing. So to 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 make that the most efficient and to truncate that, they have to do things at the same time. So one director is prepping to shoot. One director is shooting and one director is in post editing their episode. And then, so there's three directors sort of working at, at once. So like while I'm, so let's say I'm doing episode, episode three, episode two, um, with, I'm prepping episode three, episode two is shooting and episode four is, is getting their script and episode one is editing. So like everything is sort of happening, you know, and it's right. a big, it's, for network shows are big machines. Now there's, there's shows, some shows like, um, some limited series and some things like um, True Detective and things like that that have one director does the whole thing. That those right. are like you know for five, ten miniseries that type type style. But generally yeah. speaking, that's sort of like you know. So a lot of like great. So a lot of people like me who you know have our own projects. The thing that so we do sort of as a living is is directing guest directing on shows, but also you know at the same time we try to make our own projects. So that's sort of like 
sort of what, right. what that's been generally my journey. I also make documentaries with my wife, Valerie Corr. And so we made, um, we, we also ran a documentary program at Yale Law School for a couple of years. So I kind of work in both the fiction and nonfiction, but mostly for the last six years, I've been doing uh, television mostly. Got it. Got it. I mean, um, you know, I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm wondering to myself, as an artist, I can tell you that the struggle is you, you know, do odd jobs, you wait tables, you do office mm-hmm. gigs. What kind of gigs does a director or a producer take to scrap together to get his career going? Probably the same type of things. <laughs> the same type of things. I mean, you know, my first job, although I was a casting assistant, I was, you know, I was basically an office job. Um, right. But yeah, a lot of directors, I mean, you know, once it depends, like if you, it depends where you come from as a director. Some directors come from like a very technical camera background. So like if you have knowledge in the camera department, you could probably intern or you I mean you could probably get a job working as a camera assistant. Or if you um, have, I have a lot of, a lot of friends who are, were editors or then became editors after graduating from the directing program. And because editing requires a technical skill that if you've trained as an editor, you can also be an editorial assistant or you can work in something in the office. So those are, those are jobs that if you have the skill set, you can do it. I mean, there's, there's also like, you know, nowadays the barriers to making something are so low. I mean, we have like a movie studio in our phone now. I mean, you know, you can, you can make, you can shoot and edit something that is, you can always kind of create something I mean, a lot of directors, you know, try to do like small commercials, but, you know, for the most part, like if you're, if you're just starting out, you're basically doing the same. You're probably being an assistant or you're, you, maybe you right. are a barista or something. Right. It's very similar as an artist, like, you know, and then you maybe on the weekends work on your phone projects or, you know, so it's, it's, I think right. it's similar to how an actor or a stand up or someone would, would have to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I mean, you know, it, it, it takes a while, right? Like you can go to school and like you have your project and you're like, all right, hopefully people will see it. But that's not a guarantee that now you're going to be signed with a studio to be like, here's a here's a here's a five movie deal. Shut up. <coughs> Shut up. There you go. It's not yeah. like that. It's such a no. it's such a topsy turvy mercurial business where you're just like, I don't. I don't know where the next paycheck is coming from. I don't know what's happening mm-hmm. unless you kind of hit that kind of, you know, over the top where you're like an M. Night Shyamalan. And then you're like, oh, shit. But even M. Night gets put in director jail. Right. That's a that's a real <laughs> thing, too. Yeah. yeah. What who determines that you go in the director's jail and how long do they determine that you stay there? <laughs> Oh, well, I don't know. I guess it depends on if it's maximum security or minimum security, I suppose. Um, <laughs> you, you haven't been the, in it, I can level. tell. You it haven't been in it. depends on the level of felony. No, I don't know if I've been in director jail, but I definitely have. I mean, it took me it took me seven years from when I got into it. I mean, okay, so it took me about 10 years as an independent filmmaker before I started to really make a name for myself for like, people to recognize, like give me an opportunity on the higher level. So it takes about a decade. I mean... Seven. It took me seven years from my first when I first was in the first directing program to when I actually got an episode of television. So, it's uh, who determines. But like, I guess are you asked who determines? Like, it's hard. You won't get hired if you've screwed up because I feel like that's what happens with M Night. I think you may have gotten some people get in director jail because their box office didn't do well. I mean, he's his director's jail is great. I mean, he's already very successful. That's right. I mean, like, that's right. <laughs> I mean. He'll be fine, Sherrod. We don't have to worry fine. about him. Yeah, he'll be fine. Be fine. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's different for like, you know, who determines, I guess the if the question is then instead, or similarly, who determines how you get started? Well, that is that is the question. No one really knows. I mean, it's a combination of your own work It's a, and, and also then luck, <laughs> opportunity, mm-hmm. hard work. You know, all of these things have to kind of like, and for me, like, you know, even to get my first episode of television, like I had, I had a producer who said I'd hire, I, I was shadowing on Boston legal. And this producer said, I want to hire you next season. We don't know if we're getting renewed. If we get renewed, I'm going to hire you in the second half of the season. I'm like, Oh, that's great. And this, this was 2008. And then they got canceled. They got renewed for half a season. So then I, he, he couldn't hire me, but you know, he, so then, then he had a show two a year later, he had another show on NBC called Harry's law. And he said, okay, if we get episode, if we get a season two, we'll get you an episode of season two. They got canceled. <laughs> so then, you know, so, so that's not like I did anything wrong. And, and no, right, 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 right. 
it's like you know i've but like i still had these these people who were sort of supporting me so like if it happened it worked out you know th- if all these things lined up then maybe I'll, I'll you know get that so it's 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 some combination of like quality of work hard work luck and then you need to have mentors you need to have people who support you and even in the film industry even though it's big and vast there are people who want to help the new upcoming filmmakers so right. you, you just right. find those people and stick with them that's the that's part of it how do you know in, in um uh, i'm gonna draw a parallel to stand-up comedy in stand-up comedy um it is hard especially if you're a female comic it's hard to find mentors. It's not, it's a different world. I think in filmmaking, it's like, well, you know, as a director, you're like, you know, I might not be good for the job, but I think you might be good for the job. So why don't you take it? You know, or let me refer you. But in stand up, it isn't like that. It is, you know, uh, it, just like it is for actors. It's very competitive. So you're just like, I, if I'm getting a gig, I'm getting a gig. I'm not really, unless you're really good friends with the other comic, which I have done, where I'm like, hey, I'm out of town. Why don't you take this gig? You know? Or you and that people have done that to me, so we kind of look out for each other. But as far as like finding mentors, it always seems to be this challenging task to find a mentor. And I have a writing mentor. I don't really necessarily have a stand-up mentor. I, however, however, I'm a mentor to three other female comics because they come to me and I'm a mentor to them, but I don't, I've never had a mentor. So I just had to pretty much fall on my face and learn stuff and be like, oh, don't do that shit again. Um, and then just like, carry on with your life, you know? But for you, has you have your mentors been people that you, you know, who were you you know you went to you know they they were like a little ahead of you you went and you went on a set and they were a director and you were just like oh my god this person's amazing uh what how do you how do you turn them into your mentor you're like hey can i buy you coffee can i buy you dinner like whatever you can afford yeah. how, how does that even go yeah i mean it's it's got to be hard as in yours as a stand up because your job is you, you are the job. Like, you know, there's right. just you, right? Like film, film is so collaborative. There's so many, right. even though as a director, it's not, I, I, there's no film just about the director. You know, the director is That's one right. part is, is, is leading the, the ship, but there's a lot <laughs> of people growing. So, right. um, so for direct, for me, the people who I, who have been mentors to me have been, because I was in these pro, so I was in these, these programs at, the, at these networks at ABC and NBC and at Sony and those programs basically are mentorship programs. So then I would be on a show where I would shadow a director while they made it. So I was like on Desperate Housewives. And so I shadowed a director named David Grossman. And he then, so I could just, I was basically a fly on the wall while he was making the episode. And I could ask him questions and, you know, and really watch him work. And then just stay in touch with him. And sort of that's just the way it kind of happened. Mm-hmm. And they they wanted to mentor because they had seen my work. And they, I guess you know, weren't, a, I, I didn't make, I didn't do anything objectionable when I was around them. So they were okay with having me around. Um, so that's sort of how it works. And film has, is like that because I mean, there are producers, I, I mean, in the, on the feature film side of things, there are producers who like finding the next young talent. So that's the other thing too. Mm. I mean, maybe that something like that too, but like there's always in the, in the, this desire to find like, who has a new and interesting voice. I mean, that's a certain segment of the industry. Um, a lot of it is like that. Um, and so that, that means like, you know, this person tells a story in a different way or comes from an interesting background. We want to make sure that showcase. So there's still, there are people, there are producers who do that too. Like, you know, Brad Pitt has a A24, which is, you know, one of the best independent film studios out there that made Moonlight you know, and made, um, made, made this year Minari. So they make like, so there are people who are, you know, established who want to bring along the younger filmmakers. So the film industry does have that as well, but um, mm-hmm. you got to find those people. Yeah. That's the question. How do you find somebody? There are people, who, you know, reach out to me and ask me for advice and I try to help my, as, as same like you're, you're saying as, as best I can. Um, mm-hmm. And some of these people who I've developed relationships with, went on to then go on to shows in which they can hire me. So then there's also that aspect, um, which maybe yeah. they could. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's sort like, of it. I mean, you're, uh, would you, but you consider yourself more of a director than a producer, or would you say that's more like 50, 50, 80, 20, 
Or are you more of a director? I, than so? I'm more of a director. Yeah. I mean, the producing side, I have produced because I've made, especially when I make smaller projects, but producing is, producing is tough because that's really like kind of the nuts and bolts and the financial side and all the stuff that is, you know, related to the creative side. I, as a, I'm more the one who, cre- I like to be the one creating the story. Um, you know, not to be, that, that said, I'm, you know, developing and producing a film that someone else is going to direct. Yeah. <laughs> that is, uh, that, so I, I, I do do both, but I'd say I would call myself a director. Um, Got possibly, it. Uh, you know, possibly I'd say more director and writer than producer. Yeah. I mean, sure. Like, what's your kind of ultimate goal? Like, what's your, your, are you writing your own project that you want to direct and then it gets nominated for an Oscar and you're like, I've made it, mom. Like, how, you know, what is, uh, <laughs> what is the uh, kind of ultimate for you to be like, you know what? I mean, like, what, what point does, do you say to still yourself, you know what? Still, still hoping to go to medical school. That's, uh... Still hoping to medical <laughs> school, yeah. Believe me, I, I missed a call from my mom today, too. She was trying to push me for the same thing. Um, actually, she's, trying to, she's just trying to push me to get married at this point. So I'm just like, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, you, you got to pick, lady. That's either medical school or marriage. It can't be both. You got to pick one. Uh, it can't be, you know. <laughs> Can't be pushing. Marry, marry a doctor and just get you get both really. Just marry a doctor. Just get over it. Uh, they're all taken. Uh, so that, there's also that. Um, I um, I I uh, you went to you said you grew up in Chicago, correct? Mm-hmm. Yep. Why is it that every time one of my dear two of my dear dear friends are from Chicago? Why is it that I, every time I come across go folks from Chicago, they're just like the nicest people? What's in the water <laughs> in Chicago, Sean? Yeah. Uh, there are some mean people in Chicago. I know that. Um, <laughs> hey, I don't want to meet them. I've I don't want to meet them. That's <laughs> some. Um, no, we're, we we raise, we raise kind people. I don't know. Um, yeah, they there there are a lot of those. I guess Midwest folk, Midwestern folk can, are, can be very kind. So I don't yes, know, maybe that's maybe, yes. maybe, maybe, maybe there's something to that. Um, but to answer your previous question, yeah, I just want, I just, I'm basically, you know, I just want to make and create the things that I find either moving or interesting and, and be able to show it to people. I mean, really, that's the, right. that's the, that's my only goal. I mean, I, I've always had a, had a vision of a career that's, where I get to sort of direct television and make movies at the same time. So I've sort of made the directing side, the TV side happen. I'm Mm -hmm. still kind of working on making the movie side happen. So that's, that's sort of it, but you know, I'm, I have a pretty good life. I mean, I'm, I get to make make believe all the time. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) Absolutely. Someone thinks that someone, someone has believed that that to be an actual career. So, and then they'll compensate me for it, which I would do it. If they didn't know, I would do it for free, but it's, it's um, it's really. I mean, very few people get to do the thing that they love as the thing yes. that also is their main way of making a living. And so I'm really yes. grateful that I, I get yes. to be one of those people. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, for for me, Sharad, I mean, I I can tell you, like, when I uh, moved from uh, Pakistan at the age of 15, you know, stand up comedy was not a thing. Like, it's not. Like, first of all, Pakistani girls don't become stand up comics. Like, let's get one thing very clear here. <laughs> Even dudes, do, even Pakistani dudes don't become stand-up comics, let alone a woman. So that's just like, I remember <laughs> Kumail, watching, just Kumail. Just Kumail. It's only Kumail. I, right? <laughs> I remember watching uh, David Letterman uh, late night show for the first time when I had just uh, moved from, the, from Pakistan. And I remember watching it and being like, why is everybody laughing? <laughs> why is this funny? <laughs> Because I didn't have the cultural references to understand why sure. it was funny. Sure. And uh, I just kind of made it this thing for myself where I was like, I'm going to figure out why this is funny. Like what he says every night. Why is that funny? Like, I want to know. Um, and mm-hmm. for me to even go into stand up and actually even make a living out of today is like this bizarre thing. It's like I was this was not something that I envisioned, but for you, did you just, did you envision yourself starting off as a, as a writer and then just kind of were like, Oh no, being a director or producer is more my thing than writer. Uh, Boy, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I ever even thought so far. I always thought I'd be a novelist. I mean, that's why when I was in film, when I was in college and growing up, you know, I was, I was a, I was a double major in writing, but I also was taking science classes because I grew up with a, you know, although we had a literate family, we also, my father is a physician and his father was a physician. So we had, we had also that 
part of our. So I grew up all around, like a lot of South Asians grew up around, around a lot of doctors. But I also right. knew that I loved writing. That's and shocking. Was, and I was, yeah, that's again? shocking. We never, we never hear that kind of. Stuff. I know, very shocking. And no. um, when, I, when I went to, but when I went to college, I thought for sure I'd go to graduate school to get my math, MFA in in creative writing and then write novels. And and then movies just became, just felt like they were writing novels, like I was saying, in like three dimensions. So, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I am. I never really knew. Even when I moved to LA, I, I you know, I, I would meet people who told me they're making a movie and there's like people who I knew. I was like, what does that mean? You're ma- how are you, how can you make a movie? And then I mm. found out like people actually can like, they had a vision, they were raising money for it. They were getting cast. They were getting, they were getting all the resources to hire a crew. And then they were making, I was like, blew my mind. Like, Oh my gosh, one can make a movie. So even, the, even by the t- even when I got here, <laughs> you know, when I was just out of college, I was pretty, I, it was shocking that, the people can just do that. Like it was actually, you can create something. So it took me a while to really, really comprehend that. Um, yeah, this, yeah. Is a, this, this is something you can do. Right. Like it's a, it's an actual reality to be able to go and raise funding, write a project and then sh- shoot it and get it made. That's have a know. dream for, have a dream to make something and go do it. As opposed to, right. I was thought like maybe, you know, someone, you have to ask someone, they'd have to say yes. Yeah. <laughs> Some people just say, right. no, this is the thing I'm going to make. And then I'm going to find a way to right. do it. And right. That, right. Right. Kind of, kind of the great thing about filmmaking. Yeah. I mean, sure. In the past, what I would say past five to 10 years, this whole conversation about diversity and representation has really amped up in Hollywood. Like, you know, it's a big conversation. I mean, when I approached the comedy store about six, seven years ago, uh, when I launched this, my Minority Reports, which is now a podcast also, um, I, I remember approaching them and being like, hey, I want to produce a show called Minority Reports and I want to showcase people like myself because we don't get booked on your regular lineups. Like, you don't have room for us, right? Where we don't have a voice. Uh, and they were mm-hmm. like, yeah, great. And I started doing the show, but now more than ever before, you know, there's all this talk about representation in front of camera, but there, I, is there, I think there's a conversation that's happening about representation behind the camera and not just in directors and producers, but also on executive levels, because people who are the decision makers who are going to give the green light to cut the check, those people also need to be diverse. Wouldn't you, th- wouldn't mm-hmm. you agree? Oh yeah, I mean, I think that was the that is probably remains the la- the biggest barrier is that the people who have access to money or to make the the big decisions are still mostly not people of color or women. That's right. So I mean, it's changing; it continues to change, and the industry is, you know, does try its hardest. But yeah, that's the biggest. It's hard to imagine the value. Like if you're if you can't understand the value of a person of color story. It's, then why would you give money to it? Like, why would you fund it? So like, so like right. that has to, so that part changes. I mean, there's always people of color who are talented behind the camera. I mean, the pipeline to getting more has to be expanded as well. Like, you know, have to make sure that people know that it's a viable career, but, um, but yeah, it's the decision makers that are, that need to change. And TV is, keeps doing better and better at it. I mean, film is a little bit behind, but I mean, this year there's positive signs. I mean, you see the Oscars this year, we have, you know, two Asian American directors that are nominated to, um, you know, Minari is nominated for Best Picture. I mean, it's really last year. You know, it's not an American film, but Parasite won Best Best yes. first time ever a foreign language film won Best Oscar Best Picture Oscar. So you know, it continued. That doesn't mean things have changed, but things are getting better. I I, right. I mean, even like when I moved here, when I started, so I started, I moved to LA in 21 years ago. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's crazy. Wow. Um, that was and, a long time. Uh, and, and when I when I got here. I mean, there was like so few of us that well, I just we almost knew each. We all kind of knew each other, right? Even right. really between the degree of separation, like I felt like I knew every filmmaker. I think I did um, because there weren't yeah. that many. And uh, yeah. this is like the the twenty. This is the anniversary of the the following really, you know, rugged independent films that got made: ABCD, American Daisy, American Chai. All kind of came out around the same time, and there are these hardcore little independent films that people just made and then Chutney Popcorn, which came a couple years before that, they were all sort of like the first wave of this, of like my generation as filmmakers making films. And that was it. I mean, there were so few. And the only one who was really successful was M. Night Shyamalan, who just 
we'd made six cents and it was just becoming well known. And that was, and, but he was, he was already on a different plane. So that was a different kind of thing. But like, yeah. there were so few South Asians back then that it would, it never even occurred to me that one would be interested in South Asian story an Indian story because you wouldn't, you didn't see him on television. And then like, you know, fast forward to now that's, it's, it's totally changed. I mean, we've had, we've had like, there was a whole show a few years ago called, you know, um, Outsourced, right? That had like all this entire Indian cast. It wasn't a great show, and it was based on the independent film. But like, it happened. Like, it actually happened. And that was that was even before this current wave where we were having great shows like Superstore, which just got canceled, and other stores that are really, and then like you know, Fresh Off the Boat, and all these really great shows that have people of color that are did, really really surprising. Yeah. Did Superstore get canceled? Final season, yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know oh. if it's his final season coming up or if it's. Or how it just just announced a few days ago, yeah. Yeah, you know, one thing that I've noticed, Sharath, uh, is that that's changed, especially in the past five years in casting, is that now casting directors, studios, uh, ex- directors, producers, are no longer like, oh, are you kind of brown looking? We'll we'll <laughs> cast you as a as a Saudi person, and it's like, well, I'm not a Saudi person, right? I I don't I'm not fluent in Arabic, like. I can, you know, I can speak, I, I mean, I can pick up Arabic because I grew up with speaking Urdu and, you know, I have, mm-hmm. I have command of like five languages, but that's, a, that, that's a different, but I'm saying if you don't, like, you, not everybody's just being like, oh, you're Latino looking, oh, maybe you can pass for an Indian, let's just cast you as that. It's no longer that. There's a lot more understanding. There's a lot more getting rid of ignorance to be like, hey, you know, uh, South Asia is not the Middle East. <laughs> like, let's be clear, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, there are different Latin countries. Not, uh, not everybody who comes from Latin America is Mexican. Like, these kind of, uh, you know, nuanced conversations, this kind of, you know, separating and be like, okay, this person is from India. This person is from so-and-so. Like, just kind of that understanding. Mm-hmm. Um I, I recently, um, not recently, but last December, I um, auditioned for the show called uh, The Rookie on ABC with Nathan Fillion. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And the interesting thing about this audition was that it was for a, it's for a role for a, a, a Persian woman, right? Um, and Persian, wealthy Persian woman. So I remember looking at the sides, I'm like, do they want me to do an accent on this? And I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm like, fuck that. I'm not doing an accent. I'm not going <laughs> to do it. I'm going to talk like the way I talk. You know, um, and I ended up booking the job and I was really surprised. And I was like, oh, how interesting. They're no longer pushing you to, you know, I, I've been in auditions, Sharath, where they're like, can you do like the Indian accent? Can you like put it on? And then, you know, you do it and they're like, can you put it on a little bit more? And you're like, what do you want me to be fucking Apu from Simpsons? Like, what, what do you want? Right. But I feel like, when you're a director or a producer or somebody in your position, like in the past seven years, you had this whole thing about diversity and representation. Do you feel you have been getting a lot more gigs because of it? Have more opportunities come in for you because of it? Or is that still pretty sparse? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I know that like the shows are, TV shows are trying to, so every year the Directors Guild puts out a report of the shows hiring how many people of color they hired and women huh? and they have they have a whole percentage breakdown and it's like a, a little bit of a shaming report because there's a lot of shows that have zero percent <laughs> and so or like 10 percent or what shows are those so, show up? do you want to share what shows um, are those i don't remember it changed i mean every year sort of changes i remember it's like there's always something in philadelphia and a couple and some some of those shows because they have they hire so few directors because they have a smaller order they may only have a few so like to be fair to those shows they may only hire five directors to be unfair to be, to be act those five still are probably all white men so that's also a problem sure, but sure. Um, but uh shows are trying to so they, have i gotten jobs because i'm indian it probably helps now i mean it does probably because shows it, i know they need to they need to show that they're hiring people from all ba- as many backgrounds as they can and so and a lot of shows are very good at it um and i think the shows have also realized that it benefits the show to not have everyone be the same type of person um mm. i mostly get hired because people like i think like having me direct their shows <laughs> but i think it ha- doesn't hurt the fact that i'm also a person of color to help take off a, a, a box for them um sure. and there are a lot of shows that are trying this uh, initiative where they hire 50 percent of their directors are, are women 
Um, there's like, right. so Ryan Murphy Productions has a whole thing called the Half Initiative where they want half of their directors to be, it's either women and people of color or just women. But I think it's women and people of color. So they, so it's good. I mean, this is, these are all good. I mean, this is what we want. Um, so it's changed for sure. I don't know how many, I mean, but in terms of casting, which is interesting, I mean, it had, that has changed. Like I've never, I've, I'm really impressed with how casting has changed because it is, when I was, I was working on Grimm, the show Grimm, and we had a, mm-hmm. car- a storyline with a Japanese family. And they were adamant about hiring a Japanese, actual Japanese American, and not someone who could play Japanese. And I was very impressed. I was like, and I, which is what I would, I would have asked for too. I would have said we should have someone who's actually Japanese, not just someone generally East Asian. And so shows are getting the specific. They're, they're drilling. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, uh, it's good. Um, it I've makes a it, difference. It makes yeah. a big difference because you see authenticity, right? Like when you watch Kumail Nanjiani in the big sick, you know, even like some, some Pakistanis had a problem, but you know, I guess you can't make everybody happy, but some people were like, well, that's not how our Pakistani families discuss. I'm like, well, the, but you might be generalizing to say that every Pakistani family behaves a certain way. Some right. that there are different people in different cultures and ethnicities, so you can't really generalize that. But do you? But do you, but you think that it brings more authenticity to the project than just hiring somebody possibly just East Asian looking and being like, hey, yeah, you can just complain this role. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it does. It also thinks it feels like you know you're doing. If you're going to tell a story with a with a person of color or a minority in it, then, you know, get it right. <laughs> you know, like, right. you know, we had a whole right. thing. So my, so my wife is, uh, you know, sick, she's a sick American. And so she, she has been working with studios to make sure they cast sick characters in any roles, just small roles, as long as they just are, you know, just, and to help them get it right. So like, so the, the sick coalition, <clears throat> so which is a legal and uh, uh, advocacy organization partners right. with studios, so they can help them because like the, the costume and wardrobe people don't know how to tie a turban. They may not, they, they won't know sure. that. Sick, you know, most, and so to make, to get that all right, they, they have, you know, they offer for free consultants to these shows and um, you know, and still some shows have gotten it wrong. They just, they didn't, they didn't tie a turban right. Or they didn't do, they didn't, whatever they did wrong, but there's a lot of them that did it well. Like um, this is us through partly through this partnership hired, um, they had a, they just cast a guy that who just worked at a hardware store and he happened to be just a turban wearing Sardar, you know, he's just a sick. And he was just worked at like a Home Depot, just an ordinary person. But he had a very meaningful scene with one of the main characters. And it would never have happened. I mean, had they written someone like that in the previous time, they would have gotten the turban wrong, they would have got the accent wrong, they would have they would have they would have maybe not cast an Indian, they would have done all kinds of wrong things that are wrong, but instead they got that right. They cast a good actor and it was a memorable scene. And that's like, that's sort of like the bullseye. Like if you can do all that right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You have kids. You have two? Mm-hmm. Six. A six-year-old boy and a two-year-old girl. Okay. So the two-year-old's a little, but the six-year-old probably understands, probably sees things. And it's like, does he, uh, you know, get curious about what you and your wife doing? Like, daddy, like, what are you doing? Like, what is, like, you just, you, what, what do you do? Like, can you take me to work? What do you do? Well, before COVID, I mean, he had probably before the age of four had visited more film sets than I had before the age of 25. I mean, because he would, wow. anytime, anytime I had a job in town, they would come and visit. So, oh. um, so he's seen it and he actually, he understands like the making of fiction. And so I, I will actually, when I'm working, I'll sometimes film something from behind the scenes of how we're doing something, especially if it's a complicated stunt or, or a, you know, some kind of effect. And so I, then I'll come home and show him. Um, because it's pretty neat sometimes. I and mean, we just had a thing I filmed last Friday for a show. We had a whole car racing sequence like on the streets. Um, wow. And so, we, but we had kids driving, like, you know, minors. They weren't actually able to drive. So we had to figure out a way to do it. So we have a whole system of a car that goes on top of a platform. And anyway, so I filmed all that and showed him when I came home. And um, so, yeah, I think he thinks it's, I think he thinks it's fun enough. He thinks it's kind of cool. I think, you know, he doesn't watch any of the shows I make because <laughs> they're not for kids really. Um, sure. But he did. We had them um, in the episode of Nine One One Lone Star I directed last year. It was a whole tornado thing, and we had a car that gets swept up by this tornado and stuck between two buildings upside down. 
So I showed yeah. him images of when, when we were filming it. And then I showed him the final version of it because it's pretty cool. So yeah, I, I sort of do that. He's, he, um, you know, he's going to go to medical school, so it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be my next question. So I guess uh, I can just skip right over that question. You're like, but he's going to film school, uh, but he's going to medical school. No, Anyways. It's, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, this is much too hard. Uh, <laughs> you're like, he's like, daddy, you want to go to film school? You're like, beta, you mean medical school. That's what <laughs> you're, you're, <laughs> you're going to medical school. <laughs> you mean I want to be an actor? You mean doctor? Um, it's the same OR at the end. Um, if your kid wants to become a director or a producer tomorrow, would you encourage them? No, because he's only seven. You'll be seven, so um, no, it's too too young. Um, um, oh, you mean the future? Oh, okay. Um, Not tomorrow. That's too early. Yeah, schools aren't even open, man. Schools aren't even yeah, open you can't right. Go tomorrow. Um, no. I would. I mean, if if he did it because he knew it's something he loves and he wants to, he wants to tell wants stories. To tell absolutely, stories. yeah. I mean, it's it's different because like I've you know it's different than my my parents had you know they had trust faith in me when I that I would make a not reckless decision, um, but they you know they didn't know. I mean, they they didn't know. They didn't know any other filmmakers. They, they knew it was risky. They're worried a lot probably. Um, I mean, for me, I know what he'd be getting into. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. If he, if he did it, if he wanted to, now if he's like said, like I want to, you know, be a skydiver, I'd be like, I'm a little concerned about that. I mean, <laughs> maybe, maybe let's think about another one, but let's have a backup. Um, but no, I mean, you medical know, school, it, medical school, yeah, <laughs> medical school. But no, I mean, gosh, if he if he was able to wanted to live, either of them wanted to live a life of in, in a life of creativity. That's it's great. It just would be have to tell him. These are the things you're going to have to go through. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. These, these are, these are, I mean, because it's so hard. If, I mean, if I had a kid tomorrow and my kid's like, I want to be a stand up comic, I'd be like, absolutely not. Absolutely not. You are, I, I don't know how you do stand up comedy seems to me the hardest of all the, because it's, it is nakedly you. You're like, you're, 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 and then also you just have to be up on stage. I don't know. That seems like that to me is, way harder to being a director. Let me just tell you. <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, wouldn't it do is, it. It is because just like you said, right? Being a director or producer is more of a collaborative thing. I mean, I'm also a producer because I produce all these live shows and I have uh, a TV show and a, you know, a, a doc that I'm executive producing as well. But yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I'm also on that side. But yeah, I mean, being, being, listen, if you've come from a nice family and your parents were supportive and kind and nice, there's no reason to do stand-up comedy. Don't freaking do stand-up <laughs> comedy. Don't do it. It's stupid. Like, what are you going to talk about? How nice your family was? Shut up. Who cares? Get out of here. I don't care. Like, tell me the fucked up stories. Tell me how your, you know, dad used to beat the crap out of you. I want to hear thou those stories. Those are the stories I want to hear because I experienced that shit. So I want I want you to tell me the fucked up shit. Um, yeah. yeah I, I, I don't know, man. Stand up is a stand up is a dark world. Stand up is a very you know. Uh, man, God, in the beginning, you know, uh, you were talking about odd jobs and stuff like, you know, you do your odd jobs and then you're running open mics where you're standing waiting for like an hour, two hours just to do a three minute set. Like, that's the life. Yeah. Like, that's the life you've chosen. Like, this yeah. is it. Uh, but, yeah. you know, this um, this thing about uh, diversity, do you think um I know a lot of people, I know the Latinx community, uh, uh, you're talking about uh, a lot of African-Americans, uh, also South Asians have been very vocal about, you know, having diversity and representation. Is it becoming like, is it becoming like a tiring conversation at this point where because people are constantly talking about, constantly talk about diversity? Is it becoming where people are like, all right, we fucking get it. We need it. Like. <laughs> Is that is that a th is there like an exhaust is like a diversity exhaustion happening or <laughs> am I wrong? I I haven't heard it. I mean, maybe maybe at the hiring level, maybe people are getting tired of it. I don't know. I mean, people don't get tired of money though. I mean, I you know these shows like that are diverse and have like diverse audiences make money, and I think that's the you know like why why aren't there more shows for the Latino fam about Latino families and on mainstream television? They, but Fuddles me because 
that feels like that, those would all make a lot of money. Like, I don't know, there's a, I mean, that, that's, or even more shows with African American film. I mean, so like, I think, I think sure, maybe some people, the people who are most tired about it are probably people who don't understand it, who may then might be just white people. <laughs> I mean, it could also be, um, I mean, but I haven't, I mean, for as far as I understand, I mean, as far as I've encountered, no one, I've never heard any, I have not heard people who have got um, diversity fatigue. <laughs> okay, good. Good. I haven't, heard it. I haven't heard it, but then again, I, I haven't heard it, but I'm not in a position to hire people. So, you know, who knows? Got it. Got it. I mean, I mean, yeah, you're on the director's side, but, but, but when you do producing, then you are on the hiring side. Yeah, I guess. But those are usually my projects. I mean, I'm, yeah, I just yeah, it's just not something I've personally encountered. But maybe maybe there's people in the executive ranks who are like, didn't we try all this diversity stuff already? Isn't it boring? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think so. But I think it, I think it's proven to be money making. Right. You know, the show. Right. You know, if they're good right. shows and they have a diverse cast, those make money. I mean, this is us as a very is one of the most diverse shows out there, and it's a cash cow for NBC. So I, I don't know. You're talking about the nine one one show. No, this is us. The um, oh, this the, is, uh, oh, this is yeah. us. Is yeah, everybody yeah. loves that show. Everybody mm-hmm. loves that show. Um, I actually uh wanted to ask you this thing about just like you said, why aren't there more shows about you know Latino communities? Why aren't there more shows about uh, African American? Because they're cash cows, just like you said. But do you think? On the decision making level, on the the uh, the older white dudes that are sitting up there, uh, is there a fear for them to share their power or give up some of their power? Oh, sure. With, to women <laughs> or to people of color, um, and what what is the, is that fear even validated? Like that's the part that baffles me because I'm just like. If you give up some of that power, it's not like you're going to be jobless tomorrow or you're not going to be able to afford your $30 million yacht. Nobody's coming to take that away from you. Like, yeah. you're just sharing your power for more money that's going to probably be going to be able to make you buy a $50 million yacht. So I'm just, that's the part I'm always trying to figure out. I'm like, what is that fear? Is that fear of like, oh, uh, white, you know, the white executives are going to be the minority and that people of color and women are going to be the majority? Like, what is that fear about? I don't know. I mean, maybe it's it's probably related to power. Like if you if you have decision making authority, if let's say you are the decision making authority and then, you know, people around you are telling you that you need to have more voices in the room and then you get like you then you're hiring more diverse voices. And then if you feel then those people now collectively have more power than you, then you feel threatened probably. I just, I guess mm-hmm. I might get the threatened to an old power structure, really. I mean, I think that's it. it. I think it's, everyone wants to have their, you know, in the executive level, they want, you know, influence. And if you give up your influence or you give up your your power, it feels like you're compromising something. And I, my, that's my mm-hmm. guess is that people probably just don't want to relinquish any control. Um, so, you know, that, that's the same in politics, you know, that's the same in, that's the same in, you know, so many aspects of American culture uh, and life, but yeah, I, you know, the money part of it is, you know, if you're already wealthy, you know, if you're not going to be not wealthy, then, then that is a weird, that's a question. Like, why, why aren't you letting other people in? (laughs) Because like, they're not suddenly going to take your, it's not, they're not taking your wealth. (laughs) They're sharing it wealth. but like, all of these, especially in, in entertainment, like a lot of it is, you know, lucrative, very lucrative. And so, right. you know, people just don't want to cut up that pie into smaller pieces probably. But Right. Know. Right. Right. Um, I mean, you know, somebody like yourself, you have established yourself as a director. So you have a project, you go take it to a studio. Uh, does it hold a lot more weight because you have all these directing gigs under your belt? It depends. I mean, in television, television is a weird thing because as a TV director, you're sort of, you're kind of a mercenary. You're sort of for hire. If you're in TV, the writers have all the power and then directors have less so. Um, And it's the other way around in movies. So 
a lot of what I've, a lot of sort of what I've developed as a, as a director may not have currency as a writer. Now I've had pilots that we've tried to make that um, I've, you know, co-written or produced and, you know, we try to get, we try to get made. So I have, you know, been on both sides a little bit, but I've been mostly, mostly a director. So TV director also may not have a huge amount of currency as a, in feature films, but I have a track record of, of telling stories on the screen. So it all yeah. depends on what it is. Like, you know, I'm, you know, probably not tomorrow we're going to get a Marvel film, but because of television directing. However, you know, mm. it is, it, I ha, I am a professional studio director. So I have like, you know, exclusively worked in the studio world for the last six years. So right. it's, um, yeah, it all, everything sort of depends on, like if I had a passion project that was mine, like let's say, you know, I've taken one of my scripts and I'm insisting I'm directing it as a feature film and I take it to a studio they would probably not hesitate to, they wouldn't say, oh, well, can you prove that you can direct this? So I'm already past mm-hmm. that. I can prove that I can direct something that's mine for sure, because I've done it. Mm-hmm. Will someone hire me to do a 80, $50 million feature film? Well, unlikely. I mean, maybe, yeah, but it's unlikely. So it all depends, unless I've made a successful feature film, because they're, they're kind of like different worlds. There's increasing blurring in the line between fi- film and television, because it's like sort of the platinum age of television right now. And so, yeah. like, you know, and arguably some of the most creative stuff is in television. So right. there's a blurring of the line, but I haven't been, I haven't yet been like the prime. So in TV, the primary creative directing, the creative force is the writer. And there's a bunch of writer directors in TV, not a, not a ton of them. And so, mm-hmm. you know, had I, had I had, if I have a show that I'm the primary creative driving force, then I can would use that everything is sort of like leverage i guess in a weird terrible way to say but That's like right. if you if you made something good then and you you were the creative force behind it you can get people to pay attention no matter what media or format it is yeah yeah you know if, I've you, had, make, um, if you make a great short film you may not have made a fe- feature film yet but someone will give you money like you know chloe Zhao is nominated now for for best director she, yeah. she made a great short film she made a she made a feature film and then she made another feature film and then another feature film. Now she's doing a Marvel Marvel film coming up. So that's you right. know, but the Eternals, you gotta, right? You gotta, the, yeah. the Eternals, yeah. So you gotta kind of start somewhere anyway. Right, right. Sure. I've uh, had female directors who uh, they're also friends uh, who've been on here as guests. And um, this is a question I think mostly usually directed at female directors, but I'll direct this at you also. Um, okay. Has there ever been like a power struggle that who's this uh, brown dude director coming and telling <laughs> me what to do and how to do it? Has that been a, ever a, a thing for you or have you experienced that or butting heads with a director, uh, with an actor rather? Um, yeah, I don't know if it's because of race. I have a feeling, you know, TV is, I've been lucky. Most of the shows I've worked on have been very professional. I mean, but you do encounter actors who are obstinate for one reason or the other and it's not i don't think it's ever been because of my of who i am it's more about who they are <laughs> yeah. sometimes That's right you know they're, right. they're like they're kind of the, they're kind of the boss i'm a guest on these shows although i'm also kind of the boss but i'm mostly a guest but mm-hmm. you know as the guest if you have someone who's been on that show for many years and plays the main character he or she knows what they're doing and they have a way they're doing it but i i usually have a way i i don't really butt heads with people generally and i don't think i've really i have had moments where I just had actors who've just been problematic and that's sort of you know or um even sometimes occasionally a crew person is problematic that doesn't happen as much but i don't i don't think it's because of me being a brown filmmaker it's just me being an outsider i mean not, not being one who's been on the show or or it's because that person thinks they're in charge which they sometimes are <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, because one of the things I come across talking to female directors is that they're like, they won't listen to me because I'm a female director. Like, oh, they're just I like. Totally, I totally believe that. I mean, it's a, the hard the thing about a film crew is that it's very, it's unfortunate. It's very male focused. It's very like male driven. And, yes. you know, I mean, I have not yet worked with a female cinematographer on a television show, which is crazy. And I've directed wow. 30 plus. And wow. that's insane. That's insane to me. I mean, they're usually, I mean, I went to film school with great female cinematographers who are all working now. I just haven't, since film school, have worked with mm-hmm. one on a, on a 
show, which is crazy. So yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's and like most of the crews are men. I mean, almost all the departments are full of men. It's like, I it's it would be harder for you know, and there are a lot of these men who who just won't listen to female directors. It's true. I've yeah. I've worked on a show with a cinematographer who he was fine with me, but he had a reputation of didn't want to work with female cinematographers, female directors and wouldn't wow. really listen. to them. Either wow. would listen to them, but listen to them, but it was very hard to work with. It was, huh. It's, it's really, it's really awful. I, that's one thing that, you know, hopefully we'll continue to get better, but it's, it's, uh, it would require probably even more women on cruise. And it also requires from the top. I mean, it come, if you get, if you have producers who, are very conscious about hiring directors who are professional with whoever they, you know, the crew people who can be professional with whoever that's yeah. most important. Yeah. But right. I can totally imagine your friends have encountered that. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen it. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, that's why I wanted to ask you kind of that portion. I mean, have you ever experienced any kind of weird racism because of what you look on set? No, not as a director. I think I don't remember nothing. I remember as a director. Yeah, no. You know what? No one wants to upset the director. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know? So I don't really, I don't really get it. So you're, you're but, the captain uh, of the ship. You, they don't want to upset yeah. the captain of the ship. But They'd if it's a woman, me. but if it's a woman, yeah. they don't have a problem upsetting the captain of the ship. How interesting. Well, they may. They, well, they'll hide it and not say no, no, no. We're we no, it's not because he's a woman. It's because of this, and they'll make up some reason. It's not true, but I've never had anything really just from being. I mean, I I routinely am on the. I'm routinely the first Indian to direct a show. I mean, it's because because you know TV directors skew older than me, and they are generally have been white men. Um, so just by the right. odds, <laughs> most of the time right. I go to a show, they have not hired an Indian director before. So, you know, it's not like a big thing, but, you know, it's, and it, but it's, I personally have not encountered anything, anyone treating me diff badly or not listening to me because specifically because I'm South Asian, but, but I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe, um, but it has, I'm sure I don't doubt it, it hasn't happened. Before. It's also probably it happened. It was less, I think everything was less transparent before, like, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I'm sure right. it was easier to be a jerk to a black director than it sure. is now, you know? Yeah. So sure. even sure. though though still, still no one wants to mess with the director because like it's easier to fire a camera assistant than it is to fire a director. So. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, is in, in television, is the director involved in the casting process at all with the top two picks or top three picks or no? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So forget, I mean, obviously the series regulars are already there um, right. and the main, the main characters are already there, but you're, um, yeah, so when I go on a show, there's always guest cast, and so I'm in, I'm involved in the casting process. I mean, this last year, and the trend recent has been to do it all remotely. Like you just see audition tapes, and then you make choices. I like to do the in person. I like the shows that um, Criminal Minds is one that I did that did in person casting that I love doing that. Um, yeah. And uh, but so usually what happens on most shows. Well, Criminal Minds, actually, they would take whatever I said I wanted to pick, basically. But well, other shows, I'll narrow down to my top two or three. And then the showrunner, you know, executive producer, producer gets, they, they say who they want. Usually they try to, the good shows, <laughs> I say the good shows, the ones that I think are used, are the best creatively, they will consult with the director and they will take the director's choices. Now, they if they have a disagreement with the director, they'll say, well, we're concerned you like this person, but we're concerned about this, this actor for this reason. Yeah. And then I'll have a conversation. I'll have a conversation about it. Um, so sometimes it's as simple as, I mean, sometimes it's as simple as this guest actor looks too much like one of our main characters, which is sometimes it's happened. Um, or what? like, you know, or this character, this actor, um, you know, they're playing, they're playing, maybe their audition isn't great, but you know, cause they're playing this, in a certain way, but if you think they're good, then, you know, if you think you can get them to this, like, you know, kid actors are always tough too, like younger actors, because, you know, their auditions may not be great, um, but they kind of look right, or vice versa, their auditions, but they don't look quite right, so then you can feel like, oh, maybe I can work with them, um, so yeah, it's, um, so yeah, so I, I usually have a hand in it, um, and the better shows, I feel like the better shows allow me to do a little bit more. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, now, the, one that, I'm the one who has to direct them later. <laughs> precisely. But I mean, are you more, are you more of like a hands off kind of a director? You're like, I've done the good casting. I trust they're going to do the job and just go do your thing. And if there's a slight adjustment, I'll come talk to you. Yeah. I mean, when I feel casting is usually the, well, so in the right, in the, in the world of TV, so I'll just talk about TV because your own projects are a little bit different. But in TV, the series regulars mostly know what they're doing. You know, they they mm-hmm. need maybe some guidance, especially the, the 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 top, like the people who are the main main character. Like Carrie Washington didn't need much guidance. Um, you know, like I gave her suggestions and ideas, and we would talk about things together. But usually, she knew what she was doing. I mean, she obviously always knew what she was doing. The um, the guest cast is where the director does most of their directing, and so that's where. I did. I usually do a lot. Of, uh, I like when the actor comes to, with their own thing, and it could right. be wrong, but I like to see it. I like to see it, and then I can help adjust it. Um, I mean, I just was in a situation where we had a, uh, a very new actor because he's young. He's only he's only thirteen or fourteen. His first first show, really. And so, you know, I had to do a lot more of like getting him comfortable, you know, making, making, you know, really fine tuning and, and really, you know, really working harder with him because I knew I had to, but you know, uh, I'll do either. I usually, but I, I don't, I don't like to talk too much about the, with the, with the actors. Cause I feel like you get too much in their head. I mean, and also mm-hmm. it depends. There's also no one size fits all. So some actors who are very accomplished want to be, given notes you know mm-hmm. even some of the series regulars on some shows they want to be given they want to be told was it good was it bad was there something you can do differently is there something you could try differently there's some some actors want to talk about it a lot mm-hmm. um and then some actors just kind of get it and they just say no no, no i just want to do one more take i, I guess i'll figure it out and so yeah. as the guest director i kind of have to take the temperature of each person and see what yes. how they like to work um yes. but i don't really i don't like to over talk because I feel like you can you can make it worse <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to start wrapping up, but you touched upon the exact same question, which is what I was going to ask. As a stand-up comic, when uh, we are standing in the back and we're watching the room and the comic, the host goes up and we're like taking the temperature of the room because we have to very quickly adjust what set we're going to do. So we're like, I'm like editing in my brain. I'm like, oh, do sure. this, 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 that, 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 right? But I have to take the temperature of the room or it's just not going to work. Is that the same for you as a director when you show up on set, take a temperature, what's going on? Is this more of a chill crew and cast? This is more, I got to be hands on. I got to be more start. Like, is that a thing for you as a director? Yeah, kind of. I mean, that's more generally when you arrive at a show because a show has a culture and you sort of have to fit into that culture. And some mm-hmm. shows are you you very quickly know, you know, who's kind of in charge or who you should listen to, who has good ideas, who who has just a lot of ideas, who, um, you know, and then also then when you get on a crew, you can you can see how well they some most professional TV shows have a pretty well oiled machine. Some. Mm-hmm have been doing it a long time and get lazy or they just get stuck in their way of doing it. And they, they need a little more prodding to get moving faster or to like try right. something that seems out of their, 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 their control. So in some ways, yeah, you do, you do kind of take the temperature of, of a show. It happens kind of earlier in a way because you're, you get a sense of it when you get, like I've worked on some shows that have been on the air for a decade. And so, so they, they have some people who've literally been there for 10 years. And so then you get on a show like yeah. that or maybe 15, like in the case of SVU, or now it's 20. Um, yeah. You know, things like that, they have a way they're doing it and that works. And then they have a way that they're doing it that maybe needs help. And so you just sort of like figure it out. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So in some ways, I guess that is one similarity between stand up, I guess, and being stand up and being a director, I guess. Yeah. Like just uh, <laughs> kind of taking the temperature and be like, all right, you know, I can't be walking in a room and be like, so. <laughs> what are you fuckers up to like? And it's like this conservative culture. Or they'll be like crickets, like, oh, that's not going to work, you know? Uh, so you got to gotta take the temperature. It's not going to work. It's just not going to work. Yeah. Uh, not, like, no, one, one size doesn't fit all in, in a lot of circumstances. That's, the that's right. Yeah. That's right. No, I, I, I agree. Uh, sure. Are you working currently on any of your uh, personal projects? Is there something we should be on the lookout for? 
No, you know, I'm, I'm, I always have a handful of things that I'm, I'm working. In. I'm starting, so I'm still directing Nine One One Lone Star right now. I actually have, I'm almost done with this episode. It's going to come out in a, yeah. in April. Um, but for my own projects, yeah, I have. Gosh, so Valerie and I have two different documentaries that were sort of have been um, in the works for some time, and, and then I have a um, a feature film that I'm producing. Uh, with another South Asian filmmaker, South Asian American filmmakers that were just started. So it's not, um, it's just getting, it's, it's, it's a very early phases. And then I have a lot of projects I'm writing on my own. Um, next month, I'm going back to The Walking Dead. I'm doing a couple episodes of The Walking Dead. Awesome. Um, so, so, yeah, that's, that's it at the moment. Awesome. Awesome. Do you like people to uh, stalk you or follow you on social media at all? Sure. Absolutely. Why not? <laughs> where can they? Where, what 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 handles do you have that they can follow? Uh, well, let's see. I mean, I don't really use. I have an Instagram account. I don't really use it. It's um, Sharth Raju Seven, and I have a Twitter seven. account. Is, you mean there are yeah. six more with Sharth you know, Raju else, in the world? It's funny. Someone else said that. Here's a funny thing. I have an email address that I get emails from sh- other Sharths around India, around the world in India, and so I have. No way. I, but the Twitter, I don't know why. Oh, I did that because I, I couldn't just put my name. And so I had to pick a number. And I, I number seven is a number I've used when I played sports. So, um, Got it. So, Lucky uh, number seven. No, I, so Twitter, Sharth Raju 7. And I think that's also my Instagram. And then um, I have Venmo if someone wants to Venmo money. Um, <laughs> and uh, Is that Sharth Raju then, 7 too? Or? No, it's not. It's something else. I can't remember, though. Um, <laughs> you got to give the right that. Venmo, man, yeah, if you want to get the cash. I know that. Well, they yeah. may ask for money too, right? Because didn't you request money? I don't want that. Um, yeah. And then, and then, then, and then Facebook. So. And then Facebook, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, th- it might not be a good idea to give out your Venmo because uh, God knows, uh, uh, you you might be getting a money request from me. So yeah, uh, I don't, yeah. you gotta be careful. Because <laughs> I'm like, uh, all right, cool. This uh, this director, let me request some cash from him. Uh, sure, <laughs> this was this was so much fun. Thank you so much for coming on and uh, doing this chat. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will talk to you soon. Take care. Okay. Take care. <laughs> Bye. That was a lovely chat with Shara Raju, uh, producer and director. He is uh, going back to directing The Walking Dead. Uh, you guys, it is the freaking weekend. This is a busy weekend. Uh, tonight, right after this, I'm going to be headlining a show uh, online, which is uh, posted on my social media if you want to come and check that show out. Tomorrow, I'm going to be at the Laugh Factory in Hollywood uh, doing a Stop Asian Hate benefit show at 8 p.m. Pacific. And, of course, on Sunday, March 28th, 7 p.m. Pacific, is the debut of my primetime appearance on The Rookie on ABC, which is also on Hulu. You guys, uh, you can subscribe to my channel. That would be awesome. YouTube.com forward slash Mona Shake, a comedian, also on TikTok and Facebook with the same name and Instagram and Twitter at Mona's comedy guys have a good night. Have a great weekend. I will see you on Monday.